Let's do a master copy. How wonderful. This is by this guy. I'm not sure who the artist was, but there's a signature. Uh, this was grabbed off of the Arnold Brooklyn Facebook page. So somebody in that school of thought, I think. Let's start by getting this set up so that we can do a master copy properly. I am going to go to image, image canvas size. And in this dialog, I can hit this arrow so that it locks. And I can set my width to, you can do uh, equations in the dialogs now in Photoshop. So I'll hit times two. And hey, I got the exact same size on the left as I do on the right. I'm also going to make this be totally bereft of color because especially starting off, I don't want you messing with color. Uh, by switching to grayscale, it's a lot easier to solve a lot of the visual problems that we would have because we're not dealing with saturation or hue and that just makes it a lot easier. I'm not going to flatten it, but I do want to discard my color info. And let's get started with a little bit of brush stuff. Oh, let's start. Where do I start Karnak? So I'm going to switch to the brush tool and just to show you a couple of hotkeys that I think are really critical uh, to know this stuff. First off, I use the brackets to increase and decrease my brush size. And the main attributes that we mess with are up here, opacity and flow. And you can change your opacity on your brush from 0 to 100. I usually prefer to leave my opacity at 100%. And you can change your flow with shift plus uh, 1 through 0 on the number pad. So shift 1 equals 10%. Shift 0 equals 100% flow. So a lot of times if I'm trying to reset my brush, I'll go 0, shift 0. Right now, I'm going to set my flow to around 50%. And I want to choose a specific brush. I'm going to right click and choose hard round, pressure, pressure, opacity, and flow. And I can hit F5 to bring up my brush menu. And I like to add one extra thing, which is shape dynamics. And fade it with pen pressure. And I want the minimum diameter to be like 20%. If I have my pen active, I'll update the thumbnail. So you can see that it never goes so tiny that uh, it disappears. To show you an example of why that sucks, is a lot of times you get these like wispy little diarrhea strokes if you have it go 100%. So I prefer to have it maximized like there. I want my color set to black, so I'll hit D for black and white or the default colors, and I can hit X to switch between them. Now, I'm going to create a line layer, and I guess I can do this the official right way, which is I'll create a layer. I'll call this a line. And on this top layer above this, I will hit lock so that I can't mess with it. And this is where I'm going to paint stuff. And again, I like to make sure that it's all one color so that I can erase and draw on it really easily. So there's a couple ways you can do this. I can say one way is color overlay with black. And now no matter what I paint on this layer, sometimes I can paint with white, I can paint with black, and it'll always be that color. Control A to select all, delete uh, to clear it, and Control D to remove it. And on this background, I'm going to go back to pure white. So, First off, let's talk about how you could cheat. What if you're just like an unscrupulous little turd and you want to get away with uh, cheating through this? Well, that's fine. Go, good for you. You cheated. Oh, no. How could we ever tell? Oh, if you did something like uh, this and you um, set this to a history state right here, haha, no one will ever know. And now you go to the history brush or the art history brush. And you select a fancy brush like this Craig Mullins brush. Oh, I have to unlock this layer. So if you wanted to cheat, you could duplicate this layer, set that duplicate layer as your art history brush, and then you could start painting it. And yes, yeah, good for you. This uh, this cheats. And then usually, like what you do is you uh, shrink this as you go such that you can get more and more details. 
But you start big. And it's always going to reference that old history state. Why would you do this? Well, uh, it is fast. But the problem is you're not learning anything with this. And that's not the point of a master copy. The point isn't to turn this assignment in, guys. The point is to actually like put in some muscle memory and train your eye, which is why uh, this art history brush treat while cool is not what we're doing right now because this is an exercise to improve your artistic skills, not something where you turn in an assignment. I don't give a fuck if you turn this in as long as you're actually getting better at the artistic tasks I've set you. Instead, uh, here's another way you could cheat. Let's say I duplicate this with Control J and I go filter, stylize, render, what, what, sharpen, distort. No, I think it's uh, stylize, find edges. Oh, look, look at this beautiful line drawing that I did. Wow, very impressive. Yes, you could theoretically move that over here and set it to multiply. Multiply being a blend mode that will make it darken anything below it. And then down here on your background layer. Ooh, look at me. It's, now it's just a giant coloring book, right? Good for you. You did that. I feel very, oh, look at that. That's another cheat you could do. You can color pick off of the original source, and then you have the exact color that this background is. That is, yes, a valuable way to cheat. Good for you. Now you know how to cheat. But we're not here to cheat. We're here to get better at art. So I'm going to delete that, and I'm going to delete that. Let's instead talk about what we actually want to do, which is we want to train our eyes. And that's what a master copy is all about. It's about training your eyes to be better at um, sight size drawing such that you generate an image that matches the reference. Uh, we're doing this in a digital landscape with full all these little cheats and hacks. But imagine you have a canvas or a sketchbook right here, and above it is the sunset. It's the same principle, except we don't have little cheats. So another cheat that you might do is for the first task, which is plumb lines. Again, I have this nice brush. It's uh, mostly set here. And I'm going to start with plumb lines, which is the idea that wherever I pick a point, such as the top of this gazebo or archway, and I try and just make it the same exact point on one axis. So maybe I can't figure out every single thing in this picture, but I can figure out one axis. For instance, here I can actually just literally copy it. Ooh, ooh I'm cheating. Don't cheat, guys. Very proud of you that you know how to cheat, but nobody cares. Uh, so plumb lines are something where uh, we could cheat in a lot of ways. I could just come down and bring a lot of rulers that magically line up with all of these major landmarks and get my drawing off to a good start. We don't want to do that because we're trying to train our eyes so that we can empirically understand this because we have senses that are devoted to this sacred art of the picture plane. So instead, I'm going to try and uh, plumb line this as much as possible using my eye. So at this point, I'm going to hit tab and zoom in. And I'm going to think about where this little uh, barn door or whatever this is off to the side is. And I'll try and have it hit in the same place. I'll think about where this is. Where does this little part start where it touches the ground? And that is my plumb line in a nutshell. Now, another thing that's really handy to think about is triangles. So I might not be able to figure out the exact distance from here to here. But I can tell where this intersected here. And I can reasonably assume that I know what kind of triangle this is. So all the time, I'm going to do this on a layer above this to demonstrate this. All the time, what I'm doing in my mind is I'll do things like I figured out that the arch starts here, right? And it hits some sort of midpoint over there. Well, I can sort of figure out the triangle that would be there, right? And you might not want to do it on something like this, but especially for like big things, a lot of times I'm trying to think about things as um, up and down arrows. So like for instance, What's the distance that this uh, this barn door or this like distant castle is? 
I can't reasonably figure out exactly where it is, but I can tell that from there to there, it is slightly bigger than a 45 degree uh, uh, right triangle. Perfect right triangle. Or similarly, something like these guys here. I know that they are on this ledge that goes from there to there. The ledge goes kind of from here to here. How do I guess how far this is? Well, I can kind of think about the angles and that tends to help me. So that said, I'm actually going to try and not do a lot of that stuff because I want to get a little looser. And you know, that's the big problem that I have so far with this drawing is I haven't been very loose. So I'm going to hit tab and come over here. And I need to start very loose. And one thing you can do is zoom way out and that'll help. Because now you're drawing this almost like thumbnail size. And a lot of this stuff suddenly becomes easier to see. Like when you're zoomed in, you're going to pay way too much attention to these guys. But when you're zoomed out, you can see them as sort of this like blobby shape with bricks over here and stuff like that. That's another thing that's really important here is just thinking through shapes. So like going back to this layer. If I were to draw this from here on this layer, I'm going to set this to D. What's wrong? Oh, my opacity on my brush was set too low. So if I had to simplify this down into its bare components, it would probably be like this. Now let's turn this off for a sec and try and tell ourselves a little story about this. Maybe this is some sort of uh, man with a beard and he's smoking an enormous pipe. And if you tell yourselves little stories about these things, suddenly it's, uh, it's a you're able to find them out a little more. Or maybe this is something where, let's go back in time. Uh, what else could it be? It could be something where it's like, here's a chicken drumstick. Here's my KFC chicken. And over here is kind of a Mexico getting turned sideways. I don't know. Or maybe this from this side is a little doggy. And then this is perhaps the collar on him. So if you can break this down into simple shapes, that can really help you. I'm going to hit control zero to zoom that out. It can help you to find this more abstract thing and avoid getting lost in the details. Very important, very important. So like when I zoom out, you can sort of see that. I want to go back to 50, maybe. 30% on pass, 30% uh, flow. There's the doggy's head. There's his snout. There's his neck coming down. And here's his leash. And as a result, when I get into some of the details here later, it's not going to bog me down so much. Uh, you can also use midpoints a lot. So I can't figure out every single X and Y axis that comes along here, but I can reasonably figure out an exact midpoint for this. It's probably right around there. And the more you practice eyeballing midpoints, the better. So it's probably right there. And you'll be able to also do plumb lines for uh, other elements in the scene. So for instance, I can now see that I think my dog is, I think this guy is on here, I use the move tool. And you'll note that I have auto select turned off. I hate auto select. 
So maybe I can now see that my doggy needs to have his little fried chicken leg a little closer to the midpoint over here. Again, think about your triangles. Uh, you might be able to also abstract this as something where you think, well, from here, if this is how high it is, if I have that one plumb line from there to there, I can now think of a triangle and understand to some extent the angles that would be necessary for that. So when I look at this, I think this has to be a little further still because I don't think this angle would be enough on there. So. Around there. Anyways, that's too wasteful. I should be I should be flitting about a little more on this. I think of it as bumblebee mode, where you're like a little bee and you just float all over, all over your drawing. Find little errors there, little errors there. Here, I'm gonna think about a plumb line for this guy, maybe like there. And once you have a little bit of this in place, you can start having some plumb lines that are based on relativism. So for instance, the edge of this uh, background building hits into these guys that are in the exact middle of this. So I think it's actually gonna be like this. And you can see how my initial read on that was very off. Like I was just, I wanted to stick a castle there, but I wasn't thinking where. So if you are looking at other things that are around your target, it's gonna help you to figure out uh, whether you're too high up or too low. So for instance, these little columns go like there. Plumb lines are probably the number one tool that I use in terms of just thinking through these. Uh, all the time I'm trying to look at this and be like, well look, this statue back there intersects where this little gazebo hits on the top. So I maybe think about that. What about over here? Note that uh, this little turret window intersects our plant. Whatever this little blob is over here. What about an up and down one? Note that the top of that little arrow turret is Oh, I'm cheating too much. Now I'm actually like touching it. But it's slightly further up than wherever this corner is. Now it's important to start thinking about value. And if you can get value in your line art, that's very, that's very pro and I'm proud of you. Um, something like this side era, area is very tricky. That's something where like if you, if you mapped out the values, this big white shape It's the sort of thing that I look for and I try and uh, abstract it out. In fact, I think I can do something cool like uh, filter, convert for smart filters. Yeah. And we can sort of simulate the idea of having our glasses off. Blur. Gaussian blur. So something like that. That's like the equivalent of taking your, your glasses off and suddenly all this stuff is so visible, right? And now like the idea of what we're looking for makes so much more sense, right? So 
So in terms of like, think about like how you would do this in a painting. You would want to start with big areas first. It's so handy when you're painting to uh, be able to just put a big shape of white down. And then later, in, later on, you go in with the details and add in your little cloud. And notice how I'm able to like uh, think through big shapes like this little zigzag here is so interesting. And when you're getting lost in the details, it's easy to miss that. Again, I'm still just using this one brush for the most part. This sort of like hard shape of where the blacks are is also one of those things where if you can start to see this stuff, uh, you know, my goal for you guys is that you don't need to use these cheats to see these shapes. Uh, as often as possible, we should get to the point where you cheat with your eyes by taking your glasses off. No. Uh, as often as possible, I do do it a lot. It just suddenly makes it so easy to see that this like rectangle is bigger or smaller. So at some point, we're going to call this line art good. And at some point, we can duplicate it and redraw on top of it when we start getting into details. But as often as possible, I think it's, if it's good enough, get into your values. Now, values are, again, um, how we're going to fill this whole thing up. And I'm going to start by going to my, uh, what's it called, grayscale. I'll fill this whole, whole background with gray. Alt. Alt backspace to fill this. And same thing, like we could cheat. I could come over here and just color pick off of this by holding option and picking on that or alt. But you don't learn as much when you do that. So as often as possible, my hope is that you are trying to actually think through these things. So I'm going to select this nice dark color. And my brush is now bigger because I'm upping it. And you'll kind of see this, but we, in some ways, have a paint by numbers kit now. Work big to small. You can always go back later and go in with a smaller detail brush. Note how few layers I've used so far. I'm trying to be very Spartan with my layers. Being Spartan with your layers is good for a couple of reasons. Number one, if you're working on like a netbook or a two-in-one laptop, you might not have like the computer capacity for tons and tons of big horrifying layers just spilling over and making your composition worse and worse, messier and messier. And I'm going to switch to white. Now, again, my, my rule when I'm working on these things, if I'm trying to like actually improve my artistic skills, is I can't color pick off of my source, but I can color pick off of my own because these are my colors. And this sort of uh, referential constant color picking, I just have my thumb on alt and I'm touching over and over. Color pick, color pick, color pick. It's just a, a very pleasant, uh, low energy way to work. And as I go, hold on one second. Big brush, big brush. Now, if you zoom way out, you can find errors real quick. What's what's the biggest problem on? My difference from left to right. I think uh, I need more sky.
freaking kids. Sorry, I think my kids came in, knocked on the door, and then I paused and I was like, "What? What do you want? Go away!" And then I unpaused and uh, no, I didn't. I didn't unpause. So I don't know what I missed. Uh, uh, but I was talking about some stuff, such as using a white light. No, I'm just gonna get back into the mode. Did anybody see the new Pixar movie Soul? And it talks about being in the zone and being a lost soul. Man, there's so much brilliant insight for the artistic mind there. And I was just trying to explain to my kids how, like, if you're in the zone painting, that's not a great time to hear a bunch of door slamming. Asking to see a cat. So this should be higher up. Oops. So I talked about using lots of layers as your undo stack because this is just a bunch of uh, tools, right? And I can't really undo because I'm doing lots of tiny little flitty brush strokes. So you actually just want to use lots of separate layers as your undo stack. I create a layer. And I go to town on it. I can paint anything I want. And eventually, it'll start to have enough data on it that I can turn it on and off. And instead of having this sense that like I have to constantly track my layers, Let's say I, I need to undo. Well, I can just erase this top layer. So sometimes you'll see artists um, who use this sort of philosophy and they have like 20 or 30 layers all stacked together. And I'm starting to just get real subtle. And it's fun when you're like, your line art is eventually like completely subsumed into this. So another thing I had talked about is the idea of like figuring out measurements. And you can see a little bit over there. Uh, where? How about these like big arcing curves? That is something that is a nightmare to figure out. But... I can, at the very least, if I'm on my secret layer, you can see how I could reasonably predict a rectangle that goes from like where this spike is. And now I can sort of figure out like, well, this is sort of like a two thirds mark, as is this. Uh, and I can also figure out where this is inside of it. If you instead like try and like just draw the whole arc, you'll end up making a mess. So a lot of times I will draw with white. If this was actually part of the things that I recorded when my kids interrupted me, and so now I'm explaining it twice, I apologize. So this kind of goes like from there to there. And having this sense of like, you know, constant breakdowns of rectangles and um, rectangles and angles and then just deleting them as you go really helps. So now it's very easy for me to sort of see where I need to be here. Go back to my brush tool. Brush. I really like this method of the proper way to get color is I color pick, I draw it, it's too light or too dark. So you know what? I color pick next to it and somewhere in that back and forth starts to arise the official color.
that I need. So somewhere along that stroke is the gray that I need, and I think it's around there. So I want to talk about edge quality real fast. I think that's one of the last things that I message about. I think edge quality is the last thing I focus on, but one of the first things I want to warn beginners about is um, the soft brushes. Because a lot of times you right click and you see the soft round pressure size. Uh, and it'll steer you wrong. And let me show you why. If I am using a hard edged brush, I can uh, make, let's say I need to transition from this hard edge and keep it hard here because maybe it's a, um, a, a border of an object or something and transition slowly into this white area. Well from there I can just color pick the white and now slowly but surely make that transition happen. And it's something where, like, if you're um, used to this idea of, like, you color pick and you do the next thing, you can do that in, like, 10 strokes. So I have a hard edge here. That's one thing that's important. And I have a soft transition. And sometimes, like, it's not totally soft, but, like, the brush strokes are kind of appealing. To show you the opposite, the problem with the hard round pressure size is, let's say I need to do the same thing. I've got this. Well, it starts off nice. I can easily transition there, but now I have to like get it darker and darker. And I keep having to shrink my brush, trying to get this hard edge. And you'll end up getting these little sort of wispy strokes and it doesn't work well. Don't do that. There is a, a middle ground if you wanna use these soft brushes, which is going back and forth between the lasso tool and the brush tool. So you can do that. But I usually prefer, again, that hard round pressure size, opacity flow, turn on shape dynamics, set it to pen pressure, and a little bit of minimum diameter. So at this point, I might even turn my line art off and start working entirely on this. And again, you can zoom out and start to really see where the problem areas are. So I think, First off, there's this weird blotch that I just put right there. And sometimes you can clean them up manually. So I think my tree is too dark. I think uh, my castle. That house was clearly not rendered yet. Set my flow to 10%. At this big level, I just really love it. You can also use the uh, the viewfinder. I don't know where it is. Window. The navigator, that's what they call it. So this is a really good one to sort of see at a glance what's good and what's bad. So like I can now see looking at the navigator that that needs to be a little lighter that needs to be a little darker at some point I have to start being more official with my colors 
but some of these things like are really subtle it's just like very slightly um one shade too dark and you know our default colors are black and white and um it can be something that you want to go to right away and there are ways that you can sort of be more subtle with this like you know if you want an interesting experiment try doing this as a stippling project and see if you can get to the point where you're accurately showing values at this zoomed out level I think this is also kind of pleasant just because it's a little brainless. Um, again, I'm using one tool, no fancy layers, no layer styles, no layer mode transfers. We'll get into all that stuff later in class. But for now, I am being really really pleasantly dumbed down, you know? Ooh, look at this huge mistake there. See, that's the sort of thing that it's okay to just suddenly realize. What I uh, what I came across was that like oh here before I do that look at how now I can see like this was way off that like last column arch so eventually like you start you know the other thing that's great about this paint over method is uh, you don't have to be so scared you can just be like all right I'll just redraw it. You guys will be doing paint overs of each other's stuff. So especially during quarantine, like there's 50 cool things that you can do in Photoshop. It can be really satisfying to not do them. <laughs> Instead, do the, the nice dumbed down version of it. Right. Stuff like that brick detail, I'm not going to go into yet because I don't know if I want it. But this idea of like big shapes and then a tiny and then a tinier brush stroke for something like this uh, side cliff. Very handy. So this is empirical perspective, meaning um, I'm looking at it and I'm saying, well, I need mine to look like the that one. And uh, it's actually a very fun way to paint in a big, dense city, especially when you start getting into complex perspective and uh, architects who are trying to um, ruin your ability to set up a perspective grid. A lot of times it can get to the point where um, you're not going to succeed at it. I'm varying my pressure and I'm actually doing little strokes so that I can color pick them.
create a new layer. Why? Because we're starting to get a little more detailed. So I'm kind of going section by section now. I probably need to zoom out and do another check on what's the biggest problem going on. Very rare undo for me. That's because I was looking at this line rather than that line. I'm looking at my outliner and I think there's some areas that just need to be a little softer. So maybe for something like the tree, that could be something where I start to uh, finally do separate layers for the sake of organization. Because like that detail on the tree, all the little branches and stuff, that's going to be unpleasant to paint. But if I just save it as an alpha channel that I can go back and forth on, it'll help a lot. See, somewhere in here is the correct color, and I'm just going to mistake my way there until it pops into place. At this point, I could also do something where I start being a little more detail oriented and a, you know, create a secondary workspace. What is it? Window, arrange, new window for Untitled 1. If I hit F to cycle my view modes, you can see there's two of them. I can go arrange uh, and tile them like that. So that I start doing some detail work, by like zooming in on just this area.
And it's almost like you're now like painting a different painting entirely, you know? A lot of the sky stuff. I love how I just said that I should start separating this onto layers for the trees, but I don't want to. Such a lazy, lazy curmudgeon about that stuff. Like a lot of this stuff. Just make a mess. Now you have to be careful because it's easy to accidentally. Um, start to lose your way when you get into this detail level or you're painting a little bit wrong. Should not be working on that area first. I should be doing this first and you know, big to small first, big to small. So what I want to be doing is something like that. And then secondarily going in with my, my darks. Too much detail. Why am I doing this? It's too late. Can't turn back. Especially like if you're new to digital painting, I really think you should stick with this idea of like, you know, one brush, only stupid layers. No smart layers, nothing fancy, no masks, just paint. Treat this like MS Paint. And by the way, if this is what becomes your your oeuvre, this is like your method of working by preference, then just so you know, like you probably don't need Photoshop for this. You could do this in almost any program. You could practically do this like color pick, new stroke, color pick, new stroke methodology in MS Paint. So I'll put a stroke down just to color pick the midpoint between them. And now you start to get to the point where you can like see the details and really start to get in Arnold Buckland's head or whoever this artist was. Oops, I hit delete. Again, keep jumping around like that. I'm going to call it there for now, but hopefully this gives you an idea of how to get a master copy started. And uh, yeah, pretty close. All right, bye.